What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. As always, it's your boy Nick. Welcome to the video. Today is gonna be top three bold predictions. The video I do every summer before the season starts. Before I get into it, I wanna say a couple things. One, we're gonna milk the cow. The reason I'm wearing this, because it's National Cow Appreciation Day, AKA if you go to Chick-fil-A with cow attire, they give you free food. Fortunately, by the time you see this video, it's gonna be over. So I'll, I'll have enjoyed my Chick-fil-A, you probably won't have. Also, a lot more Big Dogs Gotta Eat gear on the website right now. Crewnecks, hoodies, t-shirts, dad hats, still for sale if you are interested. So a lot of cool stuff just launched, so go check that out on the website. Link will be in the description. But back to the fantasy football. Like I said, every summer I make this video. Most of these bold predictions are just out of control. They make no sense. Let's take a look back at last year's bold predictions I made before the season started. Number one, Martellus Bennett will score more touchdowns than Rob Gronkowski. It wasn't pretty but it was correct. Number two, DeAndre Washington of the Raiders will be a top 12 PPR back. It wasn't pretty and it wasn't correct. Number three, the three wide receivers in Detroit, Golden Tate, Marvin Jones, and Anquan Bolden will score more fantasy points than the three wide receivers in Arizona, Larry Fitz, Michael Floyd, and John Brown. I hit that one. Now, looking back, I know you might not say that that was a crazy, uh, crazy bold prediction, but it was at the time. Think about it because no one thought Anquan Bolden was going to do anything in Detroit. No one had any idea how good Marvin Jones was going to be. Fitz, Michael Floyd, and John Brown going into last season were all huge breakout candidates. They were all primed for big years. At least like two or three, two out of the three were supposed to break out. But I hit that on the head. Detroit totaled for 354 standard fantasy points and 567 PPR. The Cardinals pass catchers totaled 272 standard and 451 PPR. So, Two out of three is not bad for some bold predictions. Give your boy some credit, baby. Now we're gonna try to replicate that result for 2017. So my first bold prediction, LeGarrette Blunt will lead the NFL in rushing touchdowns again despite moving from the Patriots to the Eagles. I covered this pretty in depth when I talked about him on my top three sleeper running back list, but I'll go over it again for all you new subscribers. And if you haven't seen that, I'll link the video up here. Obviously this is gonna be a head scratcher. You're like, well, Garrett Blunt only did that because he was on the Patriots, right? He led the league in rushes inside the red zone, rushes inside the 10 and rushes inside the five. Move over to the Eagles and you're like, there's no way he's gonna have anywhere near that rushing opportunity, right? He's not gonna score the ball that much. You don't even know how, how much he's gonna be used. Reports have already come out and said that he's gonna be taking the Ryan Matthews role in that offense, meaning early down work, meaning all the goal line carries. So Ryan Matthews hasn't officially been cut yet, but they're saying as soon as he's healthy, they're going to cut him. That way they could save money. So Ryan Matthews out of the picture, Garrett Blunt is now that role on the Eagles offense. What a lot of people don't know is just how effective Ryan Matthews was and just how much opportunity he got near the goal line last year. Played in only 13 games. In those 13 games, he had 16 carries inside the opponent's five yard line. So 16 goal line rushes. That was tied for fourth most in the NFL among all running backs. He only played in 13 games. He only had 155 carries overall. That's a huge number of carries inside the five, a huge opportunity there. You prorate that out to 16 games, a full season, which obviously if Blunt's gonna hit this, we're gonna have to assume that he's playing the full 16 games. That gives Matthews 18 and a half carries inside the five, which is only five and a half more five and a half less than Blunt had last year with the Patriots. So that being said, there is a ton of opportunity for Blunt to get those looks again. He's gonna have to convert at a, at a higher rate. You know, he's not gonna be able to go 12 for 24 inside the five. He's probably gonna have to go like 15 for 18 or 15 for 20 if he wants to lead the league in rushing touchdowns. So I don't think the number will be that crazy high of a number. I was looking at some statistics. The same way uh, running backs were so bad in 2015, which caused a lot of people to go wide receiver heavy in drafts last year. Same thing is happening this year where it's a fluctuation of, you see all the running backs being very top heavy. There was five different running backs that scored 12 touchdowns or more in 2016. That hasn't happened since I think it was 2010. So it was a very, very high year for running backs and their rushing touchdown totals. So that's not something I expect to repeat. So I think realistically, if you look back at 2015, I think the league leader in rushing touchdowns was like 11. So Blunt 
doesn't need he doesn't need another 18 touchdowns to lead the league because that's way above the norm of uh, how many rushing touchdowns a leader usually has. You would expect the additions of Alshon Jeffrey, Torrey Smith, a healthy Zach Ertz, another year of progression for Carson Wentz. They'll be able to move the ball very, very efficiently, right? They should have a lot of scoring opportunities and Blunt should get the majority of those opportunities. Like I said, it's a bold prediction, but I still think Blunt could be up there. If not, number one, top five, but the bold prediction is boom, LeGarrette Blunt again leads the league in rushing touchdowns. The bold prediction number two Amari Cooper finishes the season as the number one overall wide receiver in fantasy football regardless of format people might not think this is a crazy bold prediction but he's never even finished inside the top 13 at the position only been 14 or higher so someone to take the leap from top 15 to number one I, I would classify that as a bold prediction let me tell you what my thinking behind this is and I think this is probably gonna be the best point you've heard on Amari Cooper yet this offseason. So everyone knows the story, right? Cooper's a top pick in the draft, top talent, matched up with an up and coming quarterback, him and Carr, gaining chemistry as the years go on. But each of the two seasons that he's been in the NFL, his performance has greatly dipped off towards the end of the season, the second half of the season. I'm gonna break both those seasons down to clarify why I think that happened. All right, so we look back at 2015, his rookie season. A few things I would say. I would say, first of all, obviously coming into the league as a rookie, you see a lot of rookies dip off uh, in terms of stamina. They're not used to the really long season. So I would chalk that up as a key point. What I would say is the drops absolutely killed him. He led the NFL. He had 10 drops over the final eight games of the season. Could have had much higher totals receiving yards, maybe even touchdowns, had he not had the drop problem his rookie season. And lastly, and definitely most importantly, is the fact that Cooper was so limited in practice, so limited during the games because of a serious foot injury that he suffered over the second half of the season, which we later found out was plantar fasciitis. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Plantar fasciitis, fasciitis. Fasatisitis. Anytime I say something stupid, I'm just gonna milk the cow. Mama. Yeah, so I would chalk it up to rookie, you know, not just not having stamina to keep it up over the whole season because a lot of them don't know what it takes. The drops were an absolute killer for him and the fact that he was dealing with uh, plantar fasciitis. Fast forward to 2016. You look at the drop issue, not an issue anymore. He lowered his total from 18 his rookie season down to five in his sophomore season on 127 catchable targets. One of the better better ca catch rates in the entire NFL now. Again though, we see that the performance dipped. From weeks one to eight, Amar Cooper was wide receiver three in PPR leagues. He had four separate 125 yard receiving games in that first eight weeks and was averaging nearly 18 PPR fantasy points a game. That's elite. The second half of the season though, he failed to reach 100 yards in any of the next eight games. Here's what I think, here's what did happen. So from weeks nine to 17, the weeks that he struggled and it didn't go over 100 yards, he only had a healthy Derek Carr for two games, those first two games. Now he didn't go over 100 yards, but in those two games where he had the, he the healthy Derek Carr, he combined to score over 27 PPR fantasy points. So 13 and a half average per game. And that was against a Denver defense and a Houston defense, both very good pass defenses. So that was week nine. I think he had a bye week 10 and then week 11. So he played well in those games. Like he still put up good PPR numbers, but he just didn't have the yardage total. And those were against elite defenses. So now week 12 comes, Derek Carr breaks his finger in the week 12 game. From that game up until week 16, when he broke his fibula and was out for the rest of the season, his completion percentage dropped from 66.4 to 50. 5.5. So clearly the finger was a huge issue in terms of his accuracy. And what's more probably important is Cooper excels on the deep balls, those big playmaking balls and a broken finger. You could suffice throwing short passes. You can be accurate over the middle, but your deep pass is going to be shot when you have a broken finger. And I think that is what really affected Cooper, his stats, his numbers, and his production. If you don't have a healthy quarterback, five fingers to throw you the ball, your deep ball is going to be very inaccurate. So here are a couple quotes from Derek Carr this offseason about Cooper. It's that thing you saw at Alabama where he just take games over. Defensive backs better know that he's really taking it serious, that he's going to try to go and attack them this year. He's not going to let them come to him in 2017. Cooper is ready to go. And as evidenced by his weeks one through eight last year, wide receiver three in PPR. He can do that easily again with a healthy Derek Carr. The reason he dipped last year is because Derek Carr wasn't healthy. He didn't have Carr throwing the ball. And in the two games that he did over the second half of the year, he might not have hit 100 yards, but he scored over 27 PPR fantasy points. Still great numbers. It's not like a, it's not like he had a, those were bust games, right? And as soon as Derek Carr got hurt, that's where their performance dipped. A lot of people don't 
haven't recognized that and haven't really put that into their analysis of Cooper. So I think that Cooper is a dynamite play this year. I think this is the year that everything clicks for them. Card's gonna be healthy. Got that fat contract. He's ready to go. Cooper's ready to eat. So again, bold prediction number two, Mari Cooper finishes as the number one overall wide receiver in fantasy this year. And bold prediction number three, the Redskins have three different receivers, three different wide receivers, not including Jordan Reed, finish inside the top 36 rankings at their position. Half point PPR, we'll say. So that means if you're in a 12 team league, three different guys are a wide receiver three or better. Again, that might not sound that crazy to you, but listen to this. On average, over the last three seasons, only one NFL team does that each season. Last year, there was two of them. Washington was one of them. It was D-Jax, Pierre Garçon, and Jameson Crowder. The Saints were the other team. Michael Thomas, Brandon Cooks, Willie Sneed. In 2015, it was the Cardinals, John Brown, Fitz, Michael Floyd. It's ironic because this was a bold prediction I had for them going into the 2015 season. The Cardinals are going to have three wide receivers finish inside the top 36. Brown, Floyd, Fitz. I hit on that one. 2014, not a single team got her done. And this year, it's going to be Washington repeating the process. Instead of D-Jax and instead of Pierre Garçon, we have Terrell Pryor, Josh Doxson taking in their spots along with James and Crowder again. All right, so let's touch on all three of these receivers real quickly. Terrell Pryor, if you've watched any of my videos, you know how much I love him this year. I've sprinkled nuggets all over my videos. Basically, last year, he went over 1,000 yards, 77 catches in his first real year as wide receiver. He was getting passes from Josh McCown and Robert Griffin III, the 24th and 36th most accurate quarterbacks in the NFL, respectively. Now he's moving over to a team where Kirk Cousins will be throwing the ball. The sixth most most, most accurate quarterback, you know, six lowest percentage of bad passes. So if he could do, if he could be a top 30 wide receiver in fantasy on Cleveland with those quarterbacks, it's not a question that he could do it in Washington. You have D-Jax leaving, right? Both Pryor and Deshaun Jackson saw the same number of deep passes last season, 32. However, out of Pryor's 32 deep passes, only nine were deemed catchable. Nine were good passes, basically. He caught eight of nine. Deshaun Jackson, on the other hand, 18 of his 32 were deemed catchable. So you take that efficiency that Pryor has on the deep ball, mix it with the number of targets that are actually gonna be catchable for him, and boom, he doesn't need the same number of targets. He doesn't need 140 targets because even with the lesser targets, they're gonna be much more accurate targets. So Pryor, easy one to discuss here. Now we move over to Jameson Crowder, who did it last year already, so there shouldn't be no difference here. He's a guy that's really quickly going up my rankings and really quickly gaining traction on like my top breakouts and my top sleeper lists for this season. He had 99 targets last year. Deshaun Jackson and Pierre Garçon leaving means 214 wide receiver targets open up. So if anything, those 99 targets are his floor. You should see upwards of 110, 120 targets this year. Reports have been awesome all off season. Uh, head coaches are raving, wide receiver coaches are, raising, uh, are raving. He's already been deemed the starter in two wide receiver sets, which means he is now gonna be an absolute full-time starter, full-time receiver. He's a really good bet to lead the team in targets, receptions, receiving yards. Obviously, the touchdown total is going to be low for him as, as a smaller receiver, but those numbers in any sort of PPR format are going to translate into a really good fantasy year. You know, Kirk Cousins, third leading quarterback in passing yards in 2016 with over 4,900. So if Crowder can lead the team in any three of those statistics, he will easily hit the top 36 as a fantasy wide receiver. Here are a few quotes being thrown around like this offseason about Crowder. He's an excellent player, dynamic player. He just continues to prove every day why we like him so much. He can run just about anything you ask him to run. This is head coach John, uh, Jay Gruden. The Washington Post reports, it remains evident Jameson Crowder is one of Kirk Cousins' two favorite targets. He can run just about anything you ask him to run. He gets himself open because he's got a great feel. He's got quickness and it's in and out of his breaks. He plays a lot longer than his size. He's got really long arms. He goes up and gets balls. Sometimes he plays bigger than a taller receiver because he's he uses his height and he's got great jumping ability. A CSN Mid-Atlantic's Rich Tandler believes Jameson Crowder definitely will be targeted more than Terrell Pryor. He's just 24. I can absolutely see Crowder having a Jarvis Landry type year. Easy 100 catch candidate, easily in the top 36 as a wide receiver. No more really need to argue this point. But as the coaches say, great route runner, which always translates into success for smaller receivers. He uses his long arms, which is good because most slot receiver, I know he's not a slot, but most slot receivers don't have that, they have the short arms now, that means he could play on the outside a lot better. So route running, long hands, goes up and gets the ball, just all these like good combination of things coming together. I think Crowder and Pryor are easy top 36. The hardest argument here obviously is gonna be Josh Doxson. Like I mentioned, Garcon Deshaun Jackson leaving 214 targets, gives a lot of opportunity to the offense. Right now, Doxson is like battling Ryan Grant for the third wide receiver spot and getting on the field for 11 personnel sets. I think just based off 
raw ability, talent, the fact that they picked Josh Doxson in the first round would almost guarantee him to win that battle. He was a 22nd overall pick for the Redskins. And Jay Gruden basically talked about this offseason how bad the Redskins were in the red zone and how they needed to improve on that. And that was like a big part of their game, right? So, so what'd they do? They overhauled their receiving casts. You had smaller guys like D. Jackson, not a red zone guy. Uh, Jameson Crowder, small. So they brought in a guy like Terrell Pryor, and now they have Josh Doxson coming back, who's big, right? He's like 6'2", uh, 215, really good leaping ability, really good, you know, go up and get it, good hands, that kind of stuff. Very good raw talent. He's in the 96th percentile of catch radius, and that's something that this offense was badly missing last year, especially in the 10 zone. So what I want to do is look at the top fantasy quarterbacks last year, right? There were five QBs that threw for at least 4,350 yards, Kirk Cousins being one of them. There was five QBs. Of all five QBs, Kirk Cousins had eight touchdowns less than the the next less leading guy. So he threw for 25. And out of those other four guys, the lowest touchdown total besides him was 33. So as you can see, he's the anomaly there. And that touchdown total is destined for positive regression, which is exactly where Doxson comes into play, especially in the red zone. So we don't have a lot, uh, a lot to work off, obviously. No sample size in the NFL. But going back to his college years, 2015 in TCU, he scored 13 touchdowns, the same number as Saints wide receiver Michael Thomas in three less games. So what I'm saying is I think Doxson is a very sneaky, sneaky play to score seven to 10 touchdowns. Looking back at last year, Anquan Bolden was the only wide receiver in 2016 that had more than seven touchdowns and finished outside the top 36. So if you're going to score eight touchdowns or more, you're getting in the top 36. And I and that's what I'm kind of banking on with Docs and the fact that they didn't play well in the red zone last year. Gruden's making a point about it. Now they're bringing in these bigger weapons. So they're getting back a bigger weapon in Docson. I think they're going to be forcing pass to him. I think they're going to be running plays, uh, jump balls, fades, and things like that to Docson. And I think he has a really good chance to score seven, eight, nine touchdowns this year and be a sneaky, sneaky play. So that'll wrap up the video. We have number one bull prediction, LeGarrette Blunt again leads the NFL in rushing touchdowns. Number two, Amari Cooper finishes as the number one overall fantasy wide receiver. And number three, the Redskins have three different wide receivers finish inside the top 36. So three different wide receiver threes in fantasy. And that's that. If you enjoyed the video, please do me a huge favor and just scroll down a little bit and give me that thumbs up button. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you taking your time out of your busy day to watch my ugly mug on YouTube talk about fantasy football. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. If you're not new, thank you for coming back again. And I just want to take a little break from the team outlooks. I'll get right back into that with the NFC South coming at you next. And my coo -coo, my dirty birds, baby. Well, that's that. Go follow us on Twitter. Go subscribe to the blog. Go shop some BDGE gear, baby. And uh, we'll see you next time. Adios.